Welcome to this year's Uwe Reinhardt uh, lecture. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, this year's speaker, Johannes Strobel. Um, and I'm pleased to see Uwe's uh, wife and research collaborator, May, here in the audience today. And I'd also like to thank Jill Chris Berg for his generous donation uh, making this lecture possible. As you all know, Uwe was someone who prized the rigorous application of economic insights to apply public policy issues. And Johannes is somebody who exemplifies that tradition. He is the David S. Loeb Professor of Finance at New York University Stern School of Business. And like Uwe, he conducts research on an impressive uh, range of areas in economics. In Johanna's case, that includes climate finance, household finance, social network analysis, macroeconomics, and real estate economics. In 2023, Johannes was awarded the prestigious Fisher Black Prize by the American Finance Association, which is awarded every two years to the top financial economists under the age of 40. He's also won numerous other awards, including the AQR Asset Management Institute, uh, Young Researcher Prize, and the Brattle Award uh, for the best paper published in, in finance. Uh, he's held um, editorial positions at the Journal of Political Economy, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Finance, and Econometrica. And so I know uh, that I speak for us all when I say I'm eager to hear uh, today's lecture on the social immigration of international migrants, uh, evidence from networks of Syrians in Germany. And Johannes is going to aim to speak for around 90 minutes with the usual uh, convention of questions during the talk. And then there'll be a reception downstairs afterwards in uh, room 200. So without further ado, handing it over to you, Johannes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Hold on, let me turn on the microphone, even though my voice, I guess, carries quite loudly. Thank you so much, Steve, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for having me. And this is a real pleasure and had a fantastic day talking and catching up with, with many friends here already. Um, when I was preparing um, for this talk and sort of thinking about what I would want to present, um, you know, I was reading up quite a lot about, you know, Uwe's life and, and, and his contributions across a whole, you know, range of fields. And I felt that this paper here, um, studying the social integration of migrants in Germany would be the best fit and the best tribute um, to him as, you know, as someone who was born in Germany and, and, and kept, you know, kept in touch and, and remained involved in the German political discourse throughout, throughout his life. But May just told me a link that I wasn't even aware of when I was preparing this, which is that in 2015, Uwe wrote a short paper on precisely the episode that I'm going to be studying here, that large migration wave, um, you know, in response to the Syrian civil war into Germany and trying to think about, you know, what makes integration possible following such very large scale um, immigration waves. So I'm really happy to talk to you guys about this paper. I also don't get that many opportunities to present to non-finance audiences. And so, you know, this paper goes down not so well to an, uh, you know, an audience largely looking for asset pricing research or, you know, the latest insights on capital structure and whatnot that it is that we do in finance groups a lot. So I'm very, very happy to have that opportunity. Um, it's part of a broader research agenda that uh, Teresa and I have worked on for a good decade um, by now with um, Mike Bailey at Facebook, who is a grad in uh, a grad school friend of ours um, that we've, you know, where we've worked with, um, you know, with data from 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 Facebook, trying to better understand a whole range, a whole range of aspects of the interaction between, um, you know, social interactions and economic activity more broadly. Um, this paper is also co-authored with um, three graduate students at Harvard. Um, that we've worked with um, on a bunch of these papers over time. Um, so the motivation for the paper, I think, is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, over 100 million people are forcibly displaced from their home countries today. Um, you know, the, the war in Ukraine has led to, a, you know, a renewed and very large-scale immigration wave into Europe. And, you know, if you uh, read some of, you know, Esteban's work and, and the work of others trying to look at sort of spatial dislocations that will come from climate change, over the next decade, I think some of these numbers are going to grow dramatically. And so the big question is, how can host countries help migrants integrate into their new communities? Um, that's kind of the bigger question we're after. There's a whole range of work that I'll you know, reference throughout the talk that is largely focused on labor market integration. Um, you know, I think in part because that's something that's relatively straightforward to measure in the existing administrative data. The focus that we're after here is not labor market integration, that obviously correlates with labor market integration, but to the social integration, right? Where the idea or the concern is um, something that, you know, Macron in, in, in France has been pushing a lot, this idea of just, you know, communities that live side by side of immigrants and, you know, natives, that very, where there's very little interaction across those communities. And I was on sabbatical in Germany last year, when I think a lot of this paper was written and a lot of these ideas developed. 
And I found myself for the first time seeing that same discourse in Germany too. Germany is not traditionally an immigration country. And we don't have, um, you know, as much of the colonial history that France had. And, you know, we just do not have any, you know, a, a sort of a large scale history of immigration. And, and so the immigration posts, you know, post the Syrian civil war, and then also, you know, uh, with, with Ukrainian immigration, I think, has really changed the dynamics and within Germany. And where so some of these very same questions that I think have been, you know, bothering and, and, and concerning people in France and in other parts of Europe, you know, for, for quite a while by now, really saw that bubbling up from within Germany. So the paper is trying to answer five questions, and we'll see how far I get in terms of walking you through the results that I find. So the first one is really a measurement question, right? How can we measure how well integrated migrants are socially? What does that even mean? What are sort of ways that we might be able to make progress on that? And, you know, some hint here is I'm going to try and use some social network data from Facebook and to try and sort of make progress on some of these dimensions, but I'll be explicit what we do here. Um, the second question is how much does social integration vary across space? Right? So when you, when you look at across different county equivalents in Germany, you know, are people equally likely to be integrated in these different parts? Um, the answer is going to be no. There's going to be substantial spatial differences in this. And then sort of a related question is like, can those differences be interpreted as the causal effects of space or is there various types of selection, et cetera, that might be explaining just equilibrium cross-sectional and relationship studies? Um, the answer is going to be there's a lot of it that's going to be the causal effect of space, which then leads you to the third question, which is what makes a space good at integrating migrants relative to another space? Um, one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to start flipping the question. We're going to start out by looking at you know, the social integration of migrants. To some extent, how many German friends do Syrian migrants have? We're going to flip that on its head because there's, you know, within the locality an adding up constraint, which says the total number of friendships between Syrians and Germans have to be equal to the total number of friendships between Germans and Syrians, right? So what makes the place good at integrating migrants? We're going to try and analyze that from the perspective of the integrators or the potential integrators, the Germans in these places, and how do they differ and what might be driving their behavior. Um, we're going to ask whether or not regional policies can influence these outcomes. Um, this is going to, you know, trying to get to what's, you know, Uwe's question, always trying to find, is there a policy solution? Is there a policy answer to some of these challenges? Um, those four questions is what I think I'll have time to talk about today. There's a first question, which I might get to, but I want to just preview what we do and what we find in case we don't get to it, which is, does exposure to migrants affect natives' attitudes over time, right? So is it if you randomly interact, randomly meet a migrant, does that change your attitudes or behavior over time? Um, what we're going to do there is we're going to use across high school cohort variation. Um, you know, across whether or not Germans happen to have a Syrian refugee in their classroom or not. And we're going to see the causal effect using sort of, you know, your standard cohort, you know, age cutoff designs and so on, trying to see the causal effect that that has on their propensity to befriend other Syrians later in their lives. And um, then we're going to find a very strong effect of past exposure, past interaction on subsequent social um, integration behavior from, from the perspective of a German. Um, that very much aligns with what the sociologists call the contact hypothesis. Um, in some sense, this is all about spatial variation, and this is about within space variation, so they're conceptually a little different. And again, I might not have time to talk about this in too much detail, but I think it's an interesting, um, an interesting sort of analysis in of itself, and I just wanted to highlight it here in case we do not get to it. Okay, so what do we do in practice? What do we do? So, we're going to focus, as I already suggested, on Syrian refugees in Germany. There's just under a million of those migrants, and it's the largest refugee population in Europe. I think Ukrainian refugees by now are probably, um, you know, probably at least similar, if not larger, order of magnitude by now. And almost all arrived post-2015, um, largely a result of the Syrian civil war, but the large immigration immigration crisis, immigration wave into Europe was really in 2015 when Uber wrote his piece and then subsequently when this really transformed, I think, all of European politics and I think following, you know, the French presidential elections, the German state elections, wherever you look, I think it casts a very long shadow around the politics around Europe. Um, and so I think understanding, you know, those past immigration waves, I think, might help us inform a little bit about where we're going to go, in particular, if we think, like I do, that this isn't going to be the last, but it's really a foreshadowing of I think what we're going to see in the future. Um, we're going to work with de-identified data from Facebook. 
to help us measure social integration. Right? And we're going to have three. So we're going to focus on you know, active Facebook users age 18 plus who are based in Germany as of today. That's going to be our, our key sample. Um, we're going to split them into th three groups that we're going to call you know, Syrians, natives, and then others. Others are basically people we can't very confidently classify as one of the others. Um, we're going to, the split is going to use most importantly, past and present location signals, right? So Facebook is very good at detecting you know, through the IP address from which you log into the platform. And you know, for some users, depending on their privacy settings, also GPS information and where you're based at a specific point in time. Syria was actually pretty open pre-Syrian civil war. So many of these had used Facebook quite actively in Syria. You then can actually track pretty nicely along, say, the Balkan routes or through Turkey or wherever, you know, the, 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 you know, wherever the migration went. And then they end up being in Germany. We also have information on self-reported hometown and high school. We have information on language settings on the platform. So we have a bunch of data points that we're going to be using to basically take the sample of 18 plus active Facebook users in Germany and to try and split them into whether or not people we think, you know, might be you know, called Syrians, people we're going to call natives. You know, people who were born in Germany, they do not have to be, uh, you know, this could be a second or third generation Turkish or Italian immigrants too, but not going to make a distinction there. We're going to call those native, native as well. Um, that leaves us with a sample size of about 350 Syrians that we can observe and about 18 million that we're going to classify as German. The spatial distribution of, for example, where, where we locate these people within Germany very closely matches administrative data on you know, population sizes of these different groups you know, across counties, across age groups, across genders, et cetera. So we think we're pretty comfortable in terms of you know, when I'm going to talk about this as a you know, Syrian migrant, that, um, you know, that this is truly a person who you know, pre-2015 or something lived in Syria and then came to Germany over time and so on. Yes. Just for a little bit more context, could you say something about the size of the Syrian migration relative to other groups like uh, Turkish people in Germany or the Poles in Germany or other migration ways? Yeah, I mean certainly with certainly with the you know the the close to a million people who came over essentially the space of one or two years. Up to that point in time, that was unprecedented in terms of its way. I think the, the Italian and the Turkish immigration, which largely happened in the 1970s, I think was a very different type of immigration in the sense that this was Germany going out to Italy and to Turkey to recruit labor. Um, to, you know, and so these were, you know, these were not quite refugees. There wasn't as much of a push factor. It was really a pull factor. They were invited into Germany. Um, to work there, um, you know, they and, and so I and, and and so I think the magnitudes are a little hard to compare because you know the other migration which didn't happen over such a short period of time it was more an ex more an extended uh, migration over sort of multiple years and it was also again a very different um, dynamic around the time so these were not I mean the, you know I think most of the the Syrians that I'm going to observe here are refugees. This was more, you know, called, they were called guest laborers. Um, many of them then stayed and, you know, you know, second and third generation. Um, but the idea always was that this was going to be temporary. It was, you know, invited in into the labor market with immediate access to the labor market and so on. So, um, so I, I, I don't actually have the exact number of how many, say, you know, third generation, second or third generation Turkish people that are now living in Germany, um, you know, in some sense, Men, they're generally German now in terms of their nationality and so on. So would that be a relevant characteristic of an area? Is how many uh, Turkish people are living, or formerly Turkish people are living there? Yeah, that's right. So I think what that's going to be one of the things when we're trying to figure out why do we see these differences across areas. I think one big important difference across areas that we're going to look at is exactly this: how much experience with um, immigration have they had? Both sort of you know, longer run immigration, there was also a much smaller wave of um, Iraqi and um, Afghan immigrants, which were, you know, somewhere between 2005 and 2015. So the decade before I'm looking at here, we'll also be looking at, at that type of, um, you know, as an explanation of why we see spatial differences as well. I was just also curious about German policy towards refugees. So I know, for example, Denmark had a very kind of clear administrative rule for assigning refugees across regions. Yes. So should we think of the government as having such a policy or was it really just 
once you're a refugee, you can go wherever you want. And so refugees are kind of indulgent in choosing where they go. No, it's a very good question. And it's going to be kind of crucial to this question here, how much of this is the cause effect of space versus selection. There is a, an important sort of, you know, random allocation aspect to it, which was called the Königsteiner Schlüssel, which basically allocated, um, you know, refugees to places based on the economic ability of places to, you know, so if you have higher GDP and more population, more people were assigned. There are papers that have argued that that's enough to basically explain all equilibrium differences as the causal effect of space. Um, I think in particular in 2015, when this was, you know, I mean, some of you might remember the pictures, just tens of thousands of people arriving at the train stations every day. I don't think it was as closely stuck to that. I think there was complete overwhelming of the local system. And so we're going to have a different identification strategy beyond just claiming that the initial assignment is random. We're going to arrive at the same conclusion to some extent. And so that suggests maybe the amount of selection you know, on relevant criteria wasn't that big of a deal, but I don't think, you know, you, you just want to say, well, we have a random allocation the way that, you know, some Danish and also some Swiss papers have, have used have used that to just, you know, go straight from the allocation mechanism to causality. I think we have to do a little more work in this setting here because it was such a chaotic period of time that I think, you know, people were just, there, there wasn't much allocation. People just arrived and went places um, and, um, and, and, and to many, you know, to a large extent also stuck around in those places. Um, okay. So how are we going to measure social integration? What are sort of the things that we're going to be looking at? And again, you know, most of this is going to be looking at the, at the Facebook data that we're working with here. Um, so the first thing that we're going to look at is sort of, you know, sometimes not surprising, we're going to look at Facebook friendship links to nearby German natives. Now, again, a lot of these period that we're going to be looking at is sort of 2015 to 2018, 2019. This was a period when Facebook was still much more actively used, um, you know, in Europe. Um, Facebook friendship links are, I think, quite good as a measure of social integration, because unlike, you know, following or something like that on other platforms like Twitter or Instagram or something like that, they very closely correspond to true social links in the physical world rather than largely online relationships. Part of that is because it requires bilateral approval. So I can't, you know, I friend Richard, but he says, no, I don't know this guy. We're not going to be Facebook friends with each other, right? So there's kind of this bilateral aspect, which I think a Twitter follower, an Instagram follower, something that does not, um, you know, does not, um, does not require, there's a maximum of 5,000 friendship links that an individual can have on the platform. So even if you click accept on everybody, you're not, you know, at some point you're just going to time out. Um, yeah, there's a lot of- What is the average number of links? I was just thinking, you know, 5,000 is- Yeah, I'll show you that. I mean, the average, no, I mean, the average is going to, the average is going to be much lower than that. I think the average, we're going to talk about 350, 400. Wow. In the US, it's a little higher, maybe five, 550. And the median is lower than that, right? So it's going to be relatively right-tailed. Essentially, nobody hits the 5,000. Um, no, but it's still quite a lot. I mean, rather, like, I have a handful of really close friends. So, I mean, what, yeah. So there, so there is, a, so there is a question about, you know, how much of this is just like your closest <laughs> friends versus, you know, people that you're acquainted with. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what Facebook friendship links mean in practice. When I'm going to try and benchmark my aggregate data against survey data, for example. Um, to just try and give a little bit of sense. I'm not trying to argue that every person you've added on Facebook is a true friend or something like that. I think at the individual level, having, say, more people that you've added as Facebook friendship links, again, where the other side confirmed that friendship is going to be indicative of closer um, social interaction. Now, I'm going to lean a little bit also on, on some, of, some of our own prior work in this space, where we've shown across a whole range of settings um, that these, you know, these friendship links that we observe on Facebook are quite good at proxying for real-world friendship links. Um, we're going to have a second measure of social integration, it's just German language use on Facebook. Do you produce content in German and do you consume content in German? So it is a way of thinking about German integration. And then the la last one we're going to use is membership in, we're going to call local German Facebook groups that are largely you know, run by natives. This is like the local soccer club would organize its social activities through a Facebook page. Are you a member of that? The local, yeah, Marcus Wunderlich Trachtenverein, you know, like, you know, the, the where we dress up around Carnival and like march through town, that, that kind of thing is a very sort of German cultural um, activity. Um, and again, you know, trying to see whether or not, you know, immigrants are members of those groups where those types of, you know, parts of very local German social life get organized. It's going to be our third measure. Um, 
first thing I'm going to argue is all of these three are really, really strongly correlated, both you know, across individuals and also across space. So people who have more friends, use more German language, are more likely to be members of these groups. I think that helps us a little bit with you know, this question here, does Facebook provide an accurate representation of social integration? Come a little bit with Steve's question. Well, you know, I've added a bunch of people, and like, I don't really, some of them I haven't seen for a while. Um, that's certainly true with my Facebook friends. Um, these different measures all have quite different potential measurement challenges. The fact that within individuals and also across space. So places where people on average have more German friends is also places where they speak the language more and also places where they are more likely members of these groups. It's the first um, aspect why, uh, you know, that makes me worry slightly less that this is just some random noise. And then I'm gonna show you on aggregate, I'm gonna be benchmarking this against survey data, for example, on, you know, how many contact Syrians have with Germans and so on to try and get a sense of all the magnitudes that we're picking up here. So sort of plausible, reasonable, et cetera. That's great. So there is no way to get a sense of the intensity of the relationship? I'm not yeah, so but, it's know. a very good question. So we've thought about that for almost every project where we've used these friendship links. And there's a lot of information that Facebook potentially has about the intensity of the relationship. Some of it relates to, you know, on-platform engagement. You know, how much do I send messages to someone else, et cetera. Um, that one to me is actually a little tricky because I think of my own friend, my closest friends, I don't actually interact with them on Facebook. I see them in real life. And so it's kind of the intermediate friends that I have that like, you know, where I would see most on platform engagement. There would be things like how much you show up in pictures with someone else, you know, that used to be uploaded and tagged and so on, get some proxy there. Facebook is obviously quite good at this because their main business model is to keep you engaged by showing you in your newsfeed stuff about people that you care about. And so it's a very big business to try and get right who you care about, which might, by the way, not be your closest friends. And that, so it's a slightly different objective function. We many, many times reweighted what we do by intensity, and it has never, ever, ever made the slightest bit of a difference. Um, and so here we also tried that and it made no difference whatsoever. So it's just simple. The binary, are you friend or not? That's what we're going to do here. But if we reweight within the friends, none of the findings we have are in any meaningful way affected by it. Should I should have the data to do all the above, but should I think of integration as these measures in absolute terms or these measures relative to the same for the in group, like friendships with Germans relative to friendships with Syrians, Facebook groups with Germans relative to Facebook groups with Syrians? Yeah, so that's a very good point. And I think one of the one of the questions we're gonna have is like, you know, you might join more Facebook groups in some parts of the country, maybe because just Facebook usage in that part of the country is more active. And so um, and so we're gonna try and control control for that. So it, the, the hope really is that this is capturing something relative, just rather than an absolute level, which might vary a lot with just differences in Facebook usage behavior across space, either by natives or by migrants, by the way, that could be driving some of these. I'm going to spend quite a lot of time ruling out that that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Engagement with Facebook generally has steadily dropped since yes. 2015, right? So when when does that kind of, like, does that affect the end of your sample or or? Yeah, so I mean, the sample we the sample we look at is active users as of today, where active means you've logged into the platform and in, in the last 30 days. That actually has not dropped off nearly as much as you would think. Most people, are, now, what has dropped off is formation of new friendship links and things like that, right? So people use the platform in very different ways today than they did in 2015. So all of this, in some, in some sense, is going to be under how people use the platform in 2015 and 2018, 2019, when, you know, when the immigration wave happened, and then I'm going to look at the over time, you know, flow of formation of friendship links when it was still a much more active platform. I agree with you that if we were going to use this to study, say, um, you know, the integration of the Ukrainian refugees today, I'd be much more skeptical about whether or not, you know, the, the intensity of usage on the platform in Germany today is still sufficient for me to be able to speak. Now, I think it would still in a relative sense, because you know most of the decline has been pretty constant across space. And so I think spatial differences are probably still likely going to reflect true spatial differences, but in terms of levels, I think it's gonna get more and more tricky over time to interpret that. And I think that's that's a very good point. But again, you know, we, we're doing the analysis today, but on behavior almost you know, eight to nine years ago when this was still a very you know, lively and active platform in general. Yeah. I guess I don't this is how I thought Kar what Karthik was talking about, or, but it's not a different question, which is 
I guess your answer was about a mismeasurement because Facebook is more active. But like if someone is just more social in a place, like they have better mental health, and so they have two more, you know, twice as many friends who are Syrian, and then you know, one time as many. So the share of Syrian is still higher, but like they're having German links. Like, what do you mean by social integration? So I would. I, so okay, yeah, sorry. I, I mean, if I misunderstood, it's it's, it's a good question. If, if it's the same or the different one, it's a good question. Either way. Um, so I'm going to just look at the absolute number of friends that you have with Germans. So if you are twice as social and you have twice as many German friends and twice as many Syrian friends, I'm still going to call you better integrated in this specific measure. But something like language usage, it, it, that's less of an issue um, in the sense that like, you know, you either speak the language or you don't. Um, and for this one here, I guess I could look at just how many groups you're in all together. Um, for that, I'm actually for this specific one, I'm actually going to take out, you know, how many groups you're in all together, because of, because the usage of the groups feature is very heterogeneous across people in a way that has nothing to do. It's just like some people join groups and some don't, and so I don't want that to be the key driver. Um, that explains a lot of the you know across individual variation. You know, some people join 300 groups and some join none, but it doesn't. The average group joining across space is completely unaffected by that. And again, I'm, you know, the other thing I'm going to do throughout is I'm going to show you some of the numbers is I'm going to benchmark sort of these integration numbers, and particularly this first one against external. So let me start out with that, just to give you some summary statistics, some numbers to look at. So this is the sample of Syrian migrants. They're pretty young. They're very male, right? That very much represents the population of people that moved into Germany during this period. It was largely a lot of you know, young men coming into Germany. So this aligns quite closely with what I had. The question before, they have about 350 friends on average, and they join about 100 groups on average. Now you can see the means here, uh, the medians here, they're both pretty right-tailed, right? So some, you know, at the, at the extremes, people have, you know, 2,000 friends, and they have, you know, 800 groups that they've joined in the 99th percentile. Um, so means are bigger than medians. But this is reasonable in terms of like this reasonably corresponds to what people have in the US, for example, as well, when you look at the same numbers. Just curious about the percent male. In, in the long run, can I, if I migrate as a male, can I bring my family with me? Because I'm, when I choose where to go, I may be anticipating I'm going to lobby the government to bring my family with me. So it's, an, that... it's an interesting question. I don't know if you first have to be approved for asylum before you can bring families or at what point you can. I, I don't know the answer to the exact kind of details. Of decision, right? I'm kind of picking the place, not just for my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. Are any can any of this information be used when deciding whether to give someone asylum or even for nationalization? Uh, As in, can you see how can the officers see and how many groups and how many German groups? No, I mean this is like this is you know the individual level data here is like you know. Strictly but protected I by GDPR. On someone's Facebook page, right? And then I see how many. I but can but see you it. only see this for the people you're friends with. Some people have, I mean, it depends on individuals' privacy settings. Mm -hmm. Some people show the various types of information to friends of friends. Most people have the privacy settings set that, like, you can only see it, only your friends can see it. So if you go on, like, some person you don't know their website, you can actually see how many friends they have and how many groups they're members of. I mean, today, if I go back nine years on my Facebook page, it's crazy what I was kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I don't, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, certainly Facebook is sharing none of this data with any immigration authorities or anyone like that. And I think it would be really, really difficult for people to observe it. I mean, look, right now we have language and citizenship tests, which I guess are a much better way of getting at whether or not people, you know, are integrated in a variety of ways. Um, these are measures in terms of the, you know, the, the um, various types of integration measures. So first of all, the average person has about five local German friends, right? Where local means within the, the same county or neighboring county that are German, at the median it's one, right? Um, th and that's not because they don't have any friends. And it's not even because they don't have any local friends. So the average person has about 15 local friends that are Syrian. So other refugees that came in, even though there's way fewer Syrians than there's Germans, right? So if you did random friending, it, it's just like completely crazy. Um, the, only about 30% of people have ever produced any content in German, you know, written a German comment or shared a German news article or something like that. And the average person is only a member of about half German friendship groups. You have to go to the 90th percentile to start seeing that type of membership. So the first takeaway here is that the, I would, my read on this is the average levels of integration are very low. Um, 
And again, it's not due to a lack of Facebook usage, right? These are people that join that join tons of groups that like add lots of friends that like log in every day, right? So it's not that like I've abandoned my account and I'm not using this. This and you know, the second thing is it matches with the SERP. So the SERP is a you know it's a German panel survey um, that um, you know following this this sort of large immigration, we've had several special modules trying to you know sample um, immigrant populations and refugee populations. Usually, you know, sample size about 1500 or something like that. And they ask questions like, how many Germans do you have regular contact with? Right. How we want to interpret that? Get six on average, right? Get five here on average. I'm not saying a Facebook friend is the same as having regular contact, et cetera. But I think ballpark order of magnitude, we're not wildly off, right? So when you walk away from this thinking, you know, integration here is relatively low. I mean, it depends what your benchmark is and what your expectation is. What are the numbers um, for locals? Sorry? What are the numbers for natives? I mean, in terms of like how many yeah. local native friends you yeah. have? I mean, like 80 or 90 or something. Yeah. Let's talk about timeline. This is how many years after this? I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you how this moves over time in the next slide. That's a very good question. So I'll see if there's any more questions on this and then I'll come back to you guys. Okay. So do you have any sense of, of the extent to which these might be kind of official friendships like this is the teacher or this is a, a government official or let something. me uh let me defer that question for just a bit because that's the beauty of seeing both sides to the integration thing right here i'm looking at how many syrian friends how many german friends syrians have but i'm going to flip this i'm going to try and understand how many syrian friends do germans have which germans have friends how much of integration is done by, I had this theory in my mind that turned out to be incorrect, but I had this theory in my mind that there's a lot of super integrators. There's just Germans who might actually work with refugees. That was actually the thing I had in mind, like the language teachers in the language school. And they just befriend all of their, all of their students. So they'll have like 50 or 100 Syrian friends. And so all of these are basically friends with the same single, you know, super integrator German. That does not seem to be the case. So a number I'll have later is that more than 70% of all friendships between Germans and Syrians are with Germans that have two or fewer Syrian friends. So most of it is a German that knows one Syrian or at most two, that's most of it. You still have these super integrators, but there's so few of them that in terms of the overall integration, it's really somewhat more broadly spread than just amongst a few local, and I'll have some numbers on that. I think those are super fascinating because I, I don't know where anywhere else where you actually be able to figure out like who on the German side is doing the work of the integration. Right, and, and who are these people? And, and, and I think there's interesting things on the on the demographics there too. So, so are these employers? Um, so some of these might be colleagues. Um, I don't know that. Um, I can't tell the source of where these friendships are formed, but this would include you go to work, you meet a colleague, and you add them on Facebook. Some kind of job, and that's the person. It it could be. It could be. Now, in some sense, if you are close enough with them that you follow them on Facebook, maybe it is helping for your social integration, right? So I, I, if it were, I don't think this would be a problem. Maybe it, for some of our interpretations, the flavor would be a little different. Um, but I can't tell in this data. How much is the economic versus social? Yeah, so I'm going to show you that in a little bit. At the region level, it, there are strong positive correlations with economic integration. Like how many Syrians are in the labor force, unsurprisingly. I want to just delay that discussion a little bit because I think there's a lot of interesting subtleties and in sort of decomposing that that I'll get to when I show you those results. But I'm clearly not arguing that this is completely distinct from economic integration. Um, the two are obviously correlated. I think, you know, as I walk you through what we find, there's a lot of things that I think are particularly interesting about the social aspect of the integration that I think are not, you know, as relevant for the, for the economic. Do you know anything about household structure in terms of the sample? Yeah, so we, I mean, we're trying to. There's like, you know, we, you, you can try and link people into family. Sometimes people self declare this is my brother, uncle, sister, et cetera. Um, many of them, at least in the early years, arrived unaccompanied, which links a little bit with do they eventually bring families, et cetera. Um, let me actually get to the next slide, get to Pascaline's question, and then talk a little bit more about the household structure that you're driving at. So, this is how this looks over time. So, this is the average number you know, of native friends. Over time, since quarters in Germany, I mean, unsurprising, it's you know, monotonically increasing um, for different demographic groups, right? And so the first thing to realize is the integration levels of males, those are the triangles, are substantially above those of women, like orders of magnitude above those of women, which kind of drives a little bit with the, you know, with the uh, certainly the traditional picture of the family there, where, you know, where 
you know, the men would be much more outgoing and, 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 and active in the labor market relative to the women. The other thing you see is that, you know, people who arrived at a younger age, in particular people who arrived as teenagers, end up being substantially more integrated later than others. There's an aspect of this, which is the people that they would befriend are potentially more likely to be on Facebook. And so some of that is going to be some of the across demographic differences, at least on the age dimension, might be reflecting demographic differences of Facebook usage amongst potential friends. Um, but um, when I compare these numbers to, again, the administrative data, um, it matches very, very closely that. So I don't think, again, that the first order force going on here is Facebook usage pattern. In aggregate, when I compare, you know, by age and by gender, and also cross age, cross gender, um, the relative shares, say, on this question of, you know, how many journalists are you regularly in contact with, et cetera, match up really, really closely. So I think that, you know, that this is sort of, in some sense, everything I'm doing up to now is, you know, because it is just looking at the aggregate, I could have also gotten out of the survey data. From the next slide onwards is going to be what's unique about the data I have. This is just benchmarking and describing, kind of giving us some, some comfort that, like, you know, we're not first order picking up noise or something weird about the data, but this is truly, you know, measuring the types of objects we're after. You stopped at 12 quarters. Yes. I mean, so you're only doing, like, 2015 to 2018 or something, or you're not? So in your example, yeah. no, in principle, I mean, so two, two parts of it. I mean, it, in principle, we can draw this out for longer. Um, part of it, if you start running into the, like, when does active use on the platform start declining a little bit? So I'm starting to wonder for the later years more, you know, are people really adding all the people they meet in real life onto Facebook? Um, I'm not also not just looking at 20, I mean, it's like in the sample, it turns out the vast majority came in 2015, 2016, but you've arrived in 2019, I'm still gonna have you here for the first three years when you're in. We also have some decomposition later um, in, in the paper, it's not in the in the presentation, it's not core to the, the, the story you want to tell about, you know, earlier versus later arriving. Like, it depends a little bit, the, the question was there, places where there's already a lot of refugees, is it easier to integrate there or later? So it's some of that, like when you arrive, starts playing a role there. It's not key to what I want to talk about today, so it's in the paper, but it's not what I have here. Um, but there's no particularly good reason to stop at 12 months. My sense is it tells the message, it's kind of monotonically increasing in a relatively linear fashion. I mean, you can maybe see some concavity here if you're like, you know, interpreting this very strongly. Most of them look pretty linear to me and the big differences in terms of integration by age and gender clearly are realized by two, three years in. And so that's kind of, I think, why we plotted it this way in this graph because that was the key thing I wanted you to take away. It's a bit hard time thinking about the levels here. How would the same picture look for the Germans who would move within Germany? I'll show you that. I'll show you that. Can I delay that a little bit? Because I think that that's going to be absolutely crucial because let me just preview when I'm going to show you that the key question is when you don't have many German friends in a given location, is that because that specific location does not like Syrians? Or is this just really grumpy, unfriendly Germans in that place that are equally grumpy and unfriendly to Germans? And half of the variation is going to be that. And I think that's going to be super interesting because that's, that's going to be completely unresponsive to any policy levels you have, right? And so that decomposition is going to play a key role in, I think, like the economics I'm going to talk about later. So, but it's a very good question. Don't want to push it off, but it's really core to what I want to talk about. So I'm going to put it off. Um, okay, so everything so far, as I said, I could have done within administrative data as well, at least the survey data. Um, but the beauty of this data set is that the very large data allows us to measure county level integration, right? Counties here is about what, 360 counties or three, eight, something at that order of magnitude within Germany. Um, and, um, and that's something that, you know, with a survey with a sample size of about 1500 or something is you couldn't have done. Um, I'm going to focus from now on only on the how many German French do you have as the measure of um, integration. But as I said before, spatial variation in that is very closely correlated with spatial variation in the other measures that we have. But instead of showing you lots of measures in parallel every time, I'm just going to stick with this one. And then I'm going to look at two questions. How much does integration vary for space and how much of that is due to place-based effect versus selection? Um, so this is the first map. You know, Steve always shows the most beautiful maps. We try our best here. People like maps. <laughs> Maps of countries you don't know very well are a little tricky because you don't really know what to take away from them. So let me walk just a little bit through what this map says. So first of all, these are, these are like quintiles 
of average number of German friends that Syrians have, controlling for things like when they arrived, and so on. Um, the quantitative differences between these percentiles are quite big. So the top decile, people have about twice as many German friends as people in the bottom, bottom decile. So it's an economically meaningful spatial variation that we're looking at. This is not just small sample noise. These are highly reliable and split samples. So I split my sample into two, calculated it across two, it's got a correlation of like 0.99, right? So this is true variation rather than sampling noise. And at the state level, which is about as much, we've got 16 German states, um, which are these black lines that you can see here, that's about as much as I'm willing to disaggregate the survey data, that sub-data of the 1,500 people are split into 16 states. I look at average integration in my data in these states. I look at average integration in that sub-survey. Again, it lines up relatively nicely. Um, but what you obviously have here is a lot of within-state spatial variation. So what do you see? I mean, the, this is the, the, the Ruhr area, um, which is um, you know, the, the, the worst part in terms of integration. Um, I think uh, Uwe was born in Osnabrück. Osnabrück somewhere here, medium levels of integration. Um, Franconia. Very bad levels of democracy for like, because it comes from southern Bavaria, the southern Bavarians and the Franconians, they're sort of, you know, not always on the same page. There's going to be lots of Franconia dissing, and they always look bad on the grumpiness, the integration, all, all, all the measures. Um, so northern Bavaria, um, hot, much lower integration levels in southern Bavaria. You see cities looking different to the surrounding areas, um, different in an interesting way, because I think they're going to differ a lot on average sociability versus differential sociability towards migrants. Um, and, and when I'm going to decompose that, that's going to show up a lot. Baden-Württemberg, quite bad. So the South, fairly conservative in general, quite bad. Um, you know, the sort of more jovial carnival regions, generally more, uh, you know, better at integration. Um, so this is my Germany for people who don't know Germany, with all the cliches fit into two minutes that I could. I don't know if you have this map prepared, but just diversion for number of Syrian friends. Uh, local Syrian friends. Yeah. Look kind of the opposite. I'll what show you that you? exactly. Okay. How, how many Syrian friends do Germans have? Yes. That's going to be the decomposition. Oh, I promise. How many Syrian friends do Syrians have? Oh, um, that's a good question. Both are I know they, there's an element of substitution. Yeah. Right? So, um, so I don't have the map for that specific thing, but what I can tell you is it's inversely correlated. Okay. So the more Syrian friends you have, the fewer Germans. Uh -huh. Direction of causality is hard to interpret there, right. but there is an element of substitution. The, the better you are integrated with the Germans, the fewer you're sort of focusing in on the local Syrian friends. That, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so this one question is, I mean, you four versus eight, mm -hmm. you told us that's a big difference. Yeah. In what sense is it a big difference? It's a big difference in the sense that like, if you interpret absolutes here, could like double integration, of Syrians. Now you might say, well, it's but a low it's level good. to start out with. So like eight's still very bad relative to four. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, in, in what I mean it's like saying if everybody had eight, then we would say everything's great. Right? No, I mean I, I definitely it's wouldn't normal. I definitely wouldn't say that, right? I think integration levels are low everywhere, including in the eight. Um maybe another way of, of doing it is average propensity of producing German content goes from like I mean, 23, 24% to maybe 36%. So maybe that's a number we can like wrap our head around a little more like 10 percentage points of people being able to produce content in German. Is that big? Is that small? I mean, I'm not going to argue I'd be happy if we were here everywhere. I, that's certainly not where I want to go. I feel doubling that metric seems like a pretty, you know, pretty sizable effect. Um, but, um, you know, but I think that's, it, it's interesting. Like when we thought about like, you know, the, when we first saw that five or six, you know, People with different priors have very different reactions on does that, you know, some were positively surprised, wow, well, when you know, some were negatively surprised. And again, it depends on like what your what your image and almost like what your worldview is. Um, so I, I I mean yeah, I mean I think it's a good question, like what is a meaningful magnitude? I think in terms of like how much of the I mean another way to think about it is how much of the across Syrian variation is driven by space versus other individual characters you do a variance composition that way and that would be maybe another way to just benchmark those spatial differences right so i look at how many friends you have i put in a county fixed effect or just look at the l squared of that that's just one other way of of trying to interpret if this is large or not um, i don't think there's a there's a ground truth 
right? Show you the number and you can say that's big or that's small. To me, it's pretty sizable because I think, um, you know, if you look at differences, say, in labor market outcomes of Syrians across these places, come back to your earlier question, they're pretty sizable. Again, directional causality is not immediately obvious. There's more it's analogy, yeah. Could you benchmark it against like Germans moving from far away into that same place in that time period? Yeah, yeah that's that's and where because, why, why is this not your answer to saying is this good or not? I mean, like just to give it a, a, a meaning, is it like a big number to what friends are built up in that time period in a certain place? That would kind of yeah. Kind of, is, 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 are, they, are they similar in terms of arriving in an area or very different? I mean, they're going to have many, many fewer. Right, so a German would make many, many more friends than a certain. That's why, in some sense, would I be happy for all at eight? Like, eight would still be order of magnitude twenty percent of the number of friends that a German recently moving into that area makes. Right, so you're still way, way off. We're gonna call this friending bias later on when we do that decomposition. Like, how much more likely is a German to befriend a newly arriving German versus a newly arriving Syrian? Right, again, that's like a factor five or six or seven. Right, depending on the space. So it, again, we're not talking about you know, in the top decile, we're kind of like, they behave like Germans. I mean, that's still like, you know, all of these levels are very low. Good yeah. question. So the geography questions. So on the Eastern borders, uh, the Syrians must be also competing with the cross-border migration of the Poland, the Czechoslovakia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and uh, So we're competing on the, certainly on the, the German market. Yeah. But that, so if you take that area out, it's not on the East, on the East it's a bit more, uh, your friends there. Um, so, do you think that's linked to that? So we tried a bunch of both labor. When we get to this, like, why do these spaces differ? When we add labor market is one of the ingredients we're going to look at, and also you know just just in general, like how many open positions are there, and so on, like just tightness of the labor market and a variety of measures, which I think you know, and, and wages, which I think both would be an equilibrium outcome of competition of cross border, you know, competition. And um, doesn't seem to be a key driver of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I was quite surprised in general, like whenever you draw a map of Germany, the east-west border usually jumps out at you, like whatever it is that you draw. And here it doesn't. And that's like, I think, interesting to me. I was surprised by that. I was, I was expecting that to be, you know, to be much bigger. Um, and so we'll try and decompose that in a little bit. Yeah. So you didn't say anything about the other measures you tried, but given that you have the whole social network, you did something along with the other. You could use that more, no? I mean, presumably, if all my friends are highly segregated and more segregated than if I have only Syrian friends, but many of them have a lot of German friends. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you could look at second order, you know, second order links and so on. Index, and that might also uh, kind of help foresee the dynamic. Presumably, that's correlated with the friends, more German friends. Early on, and then they help you make more friends. We could do that. That's not, I mean, here we just want to focus on the most basic, but I agree with you. I think the second order, I mean, both the dynamics of the network over time, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, and then, um, you know, and then the just, you know, not to think of social integration as purely first order, but, you know, second order friendship links. I think, I don't think any of the narratives are going to change if I did that, but there's interesting, I think, nuance to how we think about what we see here that I think will come. Okay, so there's four different drivers that could be going on explaining the spatial variation. Could be differences in Facebook usage patterns, right? Either Syrians or migrants use Facebook differently across space. Um, I can rule that out almost directly. Migrant usage patterns are identical across space, which links a little bit to, you know, there is a substantial amount of random assignment of where the migrants are. They're very, very small different in the average spatial differences in the average usage patterns by Germany. What's largely driving this is that there's some parts, in particular in East Germany, where the population on average is a little older, and if Facebook usage declines with age, then you're going to have a somewhat smaller share of the population on Facebook here than you have it elsewhere. We control for this, it makes no difference whatsoever because the differences are actually surprisingly small. So on all metrics, share of the population on the platform, minutes spent on the platform, number of unique days you log in within a month, I can basically rule out that the spatial differences are driven by this. The second thing could be it could be differences in migrant observables. That I can rule out quite directly too, because I can show you that they're near identical across space in terms of you know all of the metrics that I'd be looking at. Um, it could be difference in migrant unobservables, or it could be the causal effect of place. Um, 
In order to separate these things, the first part, as I said, because you know, this was the discussion with Steve earlier on, we have this Königsteiner Schlüssel, which does have a substantial element of random assignment, at least of initial location of my which um, I think, you know, I think limits the scope of selection, but I don't think I'm all the way there in terms of doing that. So I'm going to use a movers design for the relatively few migrants who move between places to try and figure out how much of it is space. I'm going to do one question, then I'm going to walk you through movers, then I go back to peasants. I'm not sure how this is included, but, but I would imagine that density of Syrians in the locality must be important. If I'm the only Syrian there, I must make yes. a term of friends. So that's going to be a, an important component when we try and explain some of the variation across space, right? To some extent, because they are negative, you know, so if, if you're the only Syrian in a small town, like if you want to talk to anyone, it's, you know, it's almost got to be the German. If there's lots of others around, you can just, it, you know, in some sense, we, we talked earlier on about these clique formation, right? If there's sufficiently many people who are similar to you, it's quite easy to just live within a social clique. So I'm going to show you some of those, some of those things as, as we go along. That's going to be part of this part. Okay. But why? I guess that's what I understand conceptually. Why do you play? Why do you call that an effect of space? I mean, that, that's very different, right? I could move the, you know, I don't see the, I don't see the. So, problem. okay, so the way I'm going to interpret, let me actually just interpret what I think about. So consider a migrant who moves from a place that on average is low integration to a place that is high integration. If place differences, and place difference can be something intrinsic, um, impossible to change about the place ever, like, you know, like is there a river or not, whatever else it is. The way I think about place is the local equilibrium. So I'm thinking about place-based effects as things that are, you know, relatively small deviations uh, of local equilibrium. So I'm, I mean, some, some of what I'm going to call place-based effect is actually going to be influenceable by policy. And I'm going to show you that later. So here's the way I'm going to think about this for now. If place differences are largely from these unobserved migrant characteristics, right? It's just in some places, all the people ended up who really cared about integrating and wanted to, you know, put an effort in in other places it's not. Um, you know, the movers' behavior will basically not adjust as that same migrant moves from one place to another. If, on the other hand, place differences are largely from, again, what I call place effects, but it's almost like a definitional thing. It's like if the same person adjusts their behavior from that of an origin place to that of a destination place, that's what I'm going to call place-based effects. And I'm going to try and decompose them into things that are like intrinsically unchangeable, like the grumpiness of the local population, um, and things that are influenceable by policy. Um, and both of these I'm going to include in this. Um, there's a lot of papers that have used this type of research design. The sample is migrants who move to a non-neighboring country. That's what I'm going to track now. Who are the movers? Bunch of interesting things. First of all, the people who move look very similar to non-movers in terms of all types of things like usage, Facebook usage, demographics, and integration behavior. There's one exception. I'm going to show you that. Before you move, in the month before moving to a different location, your rate of making German friends, actually your rate of making any friends declines. I'll show you that. It kind of makes sense. You're planning to move. You're going to stop investing in your local network. The other interesting thing is that among movers, whether or not you move to a place with higher or lower integration than the place you come from is uncorrelated with both your demographic characteristics and your free move integration behavior. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. So it's not that there's a ton of selection of people based on the integration behavior and the outcome destination. I think largely this is people who move to be closer to family and so on. And if family was randomly assigned, you know, where you're going to move to is going to be equally random. Okay. So what I'm now going to show you, I'm going to look at an outcome. So I've moved so far my, my, my Main measure has been how many German friends do the migrants have? That's a stock measure as of like the end of our sample. I'm not going to turn that into a flow measure. What is the probability that a local native, that you make a local native friend in a quarter? It's just a binary. Nobody ever makes more than one, basically. And so you can have how many you make in a quarter or binary, do you make it one in a quarter? So I'm first going to show this to you graphically. And I'm going to do that by grouping counties by integration outcome tersiles, the so top tersile, medium tersile, bottom tersile, based on the average number of friends at that stock level. And then I'm going to study migrants moving from one tersile to another, and I'm going to look at changes in integration around the moves. And I'm going to ask the question whether or not people who move to a better area integrate more. So what this graph here shows is shows people who move from a bottom integration tersile place to a place where average outcomes are in the top integration tersile, the middle one, and the bottom, right? I can do the same graph moving from a top one to a top, and it's just, you know. So first thing you see, as I mentioned this before, the levels of their integration is basically the same prior to the move. So it's not that the people to move to a place with a lot of 
good integration outcomes were different before moving to. Right? So this is essentially indistinguishable. I also mentioned they declined prior to moving. Right? If you're planning on moving, you're going to stop making, making friends. But what you then see is around the move, the probability of making local native friends jumps dramatically for those people who move to a place where average integration outcomes are higher than those people that move to a place where average integration outcomes are lower. So this is something the event study way of looking at this. Um, another way of doing it, of trying to quantify, sometimes how much does the behavior of the mover go from that of the origin stayers to that of the destination stayers? More quantitative analysis. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to model migrants integration as a sum of individual uh, um, unobservables and place-based effects. The place-based effects can vary with observables in the model that I'm going to write down. The idea is that when a migrant moves, only the place-based effects change and we can, you know, we can use the movers. Here's the model I'm going to have. On the left-hand side, for a mover, I'm going to look at the change in, the, in this mover's probability of making a local friend in the four quarters after moving relative to the four quarters before moving. And the key right-hand side variable is the average level of stayers in the destination place or stayers with similar demographics. So if the mover is an 18-year-old male, I'm going to look at 18-year-old males in the destination place. I'm going to look at 18-year-old males in the origin place. I'm going to look at the difference between them, and I'm going to regress those on each other. Right? And so this alpha basically identifies the share of the variation that's due to place-based effect. If alpha is 1, that means that a, you know, a, a, a mover adjusts perfectly from the average behavior in the origin place to the average behavior in the destination place. If it's zero, behavior is completely unchanged. Later on, are you going to look at what explains these place effects? Or yes. Is this really like rural urban? Or I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Absolutely. That's, that's key. First, I want to convince you it's causal, it's place based. Then I'm going to do the decomposition that I promised Jakob, and then I'm going to get to what it is. Yeah. If you could go back to the previous the graph, yeah. The previous, so shouldn't this be rising given what you showed us before that they make? No, this is a flow, and what I showed before is a stock, right? right? So this is the first derivative. So this is the, making, so this is a flow. Right? This is the flow. This is the quarterly probability of right. making a new friend, and so that being flat gives you the linear increase in the stock. And why is it declining before? Is this it's just because you 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 know you're going to move, and so at some point you stop making friends in the place you're about to leave in a month. There's a selection. That's how we interpret it. Um, but you know, once you move, it's basically just this flat thing, which again is aligns with the linear increase in the stock. Um, okay, so here on the x-axis, I'm basically plotting the destination minus origin quarterly probability of New Syrians making a German friend of the stayers. And here I'm plotting the equivalent for the movers. First of all, this is pretty nicely separated around zero, right? You've about half the mass. Of people moving to worse integration places, half the mass of people moving to better integration places. Again, there isn't a ton of like, I want to go to a place where we can integrate better. Um, the slope of this line is about 0.74. What does it mean? It means within a year of moving, the flow rate of making new friends of a Syrian migrant is adjusted from that of the origin place to that of the destination place. Right? That's pretty sizable. These are large effects, and you can see they happen almost immediately after moving. Right, so the event study really suggests that this is because of differences in the place. Now, I think these estimates are probably a lower bound on the total effect of space. Why? Because if you come from a high integration place, you're going to do things like learn German, which you can take to the new place you're going to move to. That's going to look like a person fixed effect to us because it's something that doesn't change as you move across space. And so it's going to look like a fixed effect, but it is actually driven by the fact that you started out in a higher integration place. So we can't capture any of these in our movers design. So I think the 75% is really a lower bound on truly like how big of an effect where you get placed makes on your ability to integrate. Do you find anything in the data that predicts where they move to? So I think that if someone asked about family links earlier on, that's how best predict Like if you have a cousin somewhere or something like that, that I mean, I'm talking with Steve earlier on, like just knowing people in a place makes you much more likely to move there. Do they move for employment? Do you think? Some of that is also that I, I would expect. I mean, I don't know how easy it is to find jobs in faraway places. So my sense is people probably move first to reunite with families and then look for jobs. It's hard for me to tell in this data set. Um, okay, so takeaway here is local environments really have a strong effect on migrants' integration. So now the big question is like, why? What is it, you know, what makes environments better for worse integration? A lot of the questions are about that. That's really kind of where it gets really interesting. Yeah. So, well, I think it's, I, I just wonder whether 
these new friendships in places are stable. So have you looked at the degree to which these remain active? Yeah, so so it, it, what's a little tricky here is, I mean, unfriending is essentially a known thing, right? Once you add someone on Facebook, you don't really ever, I mean, unless around the US elections, <laughs> but people, no, I mean, the only, like, you see that around the US election, people like unfriend, but like, except for that, it never really happens. So there I would then need to go to what Pascalina asked the intensity, do I see it decline on I just, I just don't have really good enough measures of that. What about not accepting friendship requests? We've thought about, we've not worked with that data. It's an, there's like two aspects that I think are interesting. One of them, who initiates it, right? So someone sends it, someone accepts, and then whether or not they get accepted. It's on our list of things to do. It's an interesting question. I, what's a little tricky about that one is sort of the sociology around sending friendship requests is really a weird thing. But it's like today you don't send them anymore because it's kind of like you're admitting you're still using the platform, which is a little embarrassing. And we should look at it. We haven't, there's probably some interesting things to do here. Um, in particular, I think on the initiation, who sends the link? Is it a German inviting Syrian? But there's a lot of like weird social hierarchy stuff here where it's like, you know, bosses can invite employees, but employees can't invite. It, it's, it's weird. And so we haven't really wrapped our head around and kind of ignored it so far. That doesn't mean there isn't anything interesting here. Okay, so we're going to focus on the behavior of natives first to kind of teach about this. And um, who are the natives who are doing the integration? I already talked about this a little bit. 94% of Germans have zero Syrian friends, right? That's not that surprising because it's like 80 million German, 1 million Syrians. Um, and we already knew the Syrians don't have many German friends, so most Germans won't have any Syrian friends. But I already mentioned this one here, that like 71% of all friendships between Germans and Syrians are to Germans with three or fewer Syrian friends. Right? That's kind of to your question, is this the teachers or the government officials who meet hundreds of them? These super integrators, as I said, they exist, um, but there's so few of them that they don't really drive what's going on. The other thing is the integrators are quite likely to be yeah, male and young. That's not that surprising. I mean, you talk about homophily, right? People are just friends with others that are like them. It surprised me a little because if you think back to 2015, 16, who are following this, right? It was all like my mother was at the train station and they were all like helping the Syrian settle in and so on. So it was very much like the, you know, the older female generation who was very active in welcoming the refugees and kind of trying to help them settle. Um, so I was thinking like it was all going to be them that like helped and so on. It, it's not. In the end, homophily wins over everything else. It's the Syrian refugees were young and male. The Germans said no Syrians are young and male. Um, Sorry, so why do you call them integrators? Because the fact that it's a linear relationship is kind of striking. I would have thought that once I've met a friend, I become friends with a friend of my friend, and so I was expecting something to be kind of. So it's an interesting question of why. I mean, I call them integrators just because they're on the other side of that object that I call integration. So that's kind of, but, but I agree with you. There's actually an interesting question which relates to the dynamic of those second, you know, the second order and so on. Look at Germans making friends with Germans. You see this linear relationship or like friendships among Syrians. Is it also linear? Or is yeah. there a very specific feature of this? So I, I, answer is going to be the same. I haven't looked at those second order dynamics. Like once you meet a person, how much more likely are you to befriend their friends? I have that a little bit in this stuff on like, you, you know, you have a Syrian in your high school and like, when you then make other Syrian friends in other settings, we have to be quite careful that it's not just you now meet their friends and so on, but that it truly is. So, so we do a better job there. For this part here, the spatial stuff, I just haven't done that yet. It, it's interesting. Yeah, right. um, so again, we're going to have this adding up relationship where the number of friendship from Syrians to Germans is the number of friendship from Germans to Syrians. The only equation I'm going to have in this paper is a formal version of this decomposition. So basically, this here gives you the, the average number of German local friends among Syrians. This is this object that we called integration so far. And we're going to decompose that into two objects. The first one is what we want to call general friendliness. This is the average number of German local friends that Germans have, right? And this object here, which we're going to call relative friendliness, which is how much does the ratio of Syrian to German friends of Germans deviate from the population share of Syrians, right? So this would be one. If Germans befriended everybody at random probabilities, and so the share of Syrian friends to German friends would be equal to the population share of Syrians. If this is below one, it means that you know you're in some sense biased against making friends with a given Syrian relative to making friends with a given German. This object here is like pretty low. This is what I mentioned before, right? Like even at the even at the highest levels, it's not like Syrians are being befriended at anywhere near their population shares. Um, so this is this is an identity. Right. Um, 
Again, general friending is kept as how many friends do natives have. Relative friending kept as do natives befriend Syrians in proportion to their local population. Now, what's interesting is variation in both of these ends up strongly correlated with, say, labor market success of the Syrian. Right? So in some sense, I don't care that much from one perspective about is it that in this place the Syrians are struggling to make friends because Germans are just grumpy towards anyone, and that's what makes it difficult for them to say enter the labor market. Or is it the fact that actually Germans are quite jovial here, but they dislike the immigrants much more, right? So in some, for some outcomes, it doesn't really matter. But from a policy perspective, it makes a huge difference because this thing here, I'm not going to be able to move very much around, right? Like if there's just general like cultures of openness towards anyone, including Germans, it's going to be much less movable than sort of the relative shift towards Germans. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you policies and I'm going to show you it moves this quite a lot and it does nothing to moving this, right? So I think as a conceptually, I think this is where you were going. It took us a while to wrap our head around this because initially, we were like struggling with how to think about the fact that just Germans just have different number of friends and Facebook friends across different counties. And how do you think about that? And if that was a problem, but actually I think it's part of the explanation of why in some parts Syrians have been, Germans have a way easier time in some parts of the country than others when they move there. And it's got nothing to do, you know, and then there is the relative friendliness, which is the stuff that's sort of specific to a Syrian rather than specific to any newcomer. And again, I think that as a conceptual distinction will help us figure out where policy solutions are likely to be most effective. Um, so here's again two maps. General friendliness. Can I ask you yes. even, even for some purposes though, so for example, if, if your rank in friendliness affects like your likelihood of being of finding a job, mm -hmm. then it's not clear. Right? So what, what I say is that if if everybody is, is friendly, but I'm still at the at the second percentile or whatever, yeah. then I'm much less likely to be connected to the right kinds of things. It's not obvious that that absolute value is like Yeah, so my, my sense here is more like from the perspective of a migrant, just any links they get, whether or not it's because people are open to anyone or they like immigrants, it's helpful to just integrate in the labor market and so on. Um, okay, so here the no so this is like, you know, again, this place here, it, it, it always shows up bad. Um, so um, no friendly see the north south divide here is something that like I think most Germans would have guessed, right? The people from Hamburg and the northern Germans, <laughs> <Mira Slavia too. laughs> uh, this clearly would align with sort of stereotypes that you would have about parts of the country where people are a little more grumpy. Again, Marcus will like that, you know, the, the Franconians less friendly than the, you know, the, 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 the other Bavarians. Um, so this is something, you know, that actually if you, if you align it again with other survey data on social stuff that links quite closely. Let me just do one more slide and then I'll, I'll take the questions. Here is the opposite. Here's relative friending, right? And relative friending is actually, for example, quite high in East Germany, which is to some extent surprising, right? Because we think of East Germany, high votes for the right wing parties and so on, right? That's one thing. But on the other hand, the story, these are largely small rural places where there's maybe only relatively few Syrians arriving. So they might actually end up being better integrated there than the big multicultural cities where there's lots of people that all like migrants, but they don't really have time to get to know anyone around them. At all. So take these, here's just the correlation of them across space. It looks like they're very spatially correlated here, but if you do population weighted correlation, they're not actually all that strongly correlated with each other. This one here is like, you know, the North Rhine Westphalia, Cologne, Dusseldorf, and so on. They're not friendly in general, and they are particularly unfriendly towards migrants. Um, but you can see that like different combinations here can have the same outcome in terms of creating opportunities for integration for migrants. Um, and you can also imagine that this dimension here is going to be much more easy to shift around from a policy dimension, like moving people horizontally here, rather than trying to move people vertically, where you have to change the overall sort of, you know, general attitude, you know, of Germans, which is, again, almost to the level of a cliche, you know, it, it, it is going to be very, very hard to change. There was a question, and then I'm, yeah, oh, okay, Marcus, yeah. If you look at the map, does it coincide with the Catholic versus Protestants? <laughs> I mean, the Franconia part certainly does, no? Yes. Yeah, no, I'm trying to be not, okay. not, not, not too provocative. But I mean, in some sense, this thing here, you know, the, the, the you know, the so many papers of, you know, the Swiss and the, you know, the very sort of, you know, frugal Protestant Swiss and so on. I mean, this is not, in some sense, not a surprise, right? We know this. I think what was new to me is like how much of that variation explains just how well, in, you know, like linking that just general attitude of people towards integration of migrants, and that's like half the variation is just that. 
just wasn't like that in me. Maybe it should have been obvious to me. It took me a while to wrap my head around it. Um, and you know, it, I think it's interesting. It was not clear for me from the text outside whether this is actually implementing what Jakob was saying about people moving. No, no, that, that comes next. Ah, that okay. comes next. So okay. let me get to that. So why do general and relative friendliness differ across places? It could be characteristics of the nature, just the immutable preferences of people, or it could be institution, and I'm going to call it local equilibria. And this is kind of, you know, what you think in space, they could just be an equilibrium in a space that is not immutable, but it is something to do with the space. Now, unlike for migrants, there's no initial random assignment of Germans across places. So it could well be that this is all, you know, in Northern Germany, people are just always grumpy. And like you move them to the south and they'll still be grumpy and not make any German friends. So we're going to use the exact same mover design to address that question. So this is now the change in a native mover's level of either general friendly. So you move with someone from Hamburg to Munich. Does their rate of making local German friends go up around that move? And we're also going to do the same with relative friending, right? When you go from a place where Syrians are not befriended you know, in proportion to their population share, to a place where they are, is the behavior of the mover over time adjusting from that of the origin to that of the destination? So it's a very similar design as we had before, but now looking at Germans' behavior, both towards other Germans, the general friendliness, and specifically towards migrants. I mean, about this relative versus absolute, you're saying the significance of making a local uh, native German friend is kind of invariant across space. Right. That's fair. So I'm I'm, I'm taking it some sense. Seem right. I mean, a place where everybody, if the network is very dense somewhere, and you meet one person, then you have access to the whole network. Yeah. And another place meeting one person where everybody is unconnected doesn't. Yeah. So that comes a little bit to to your question as well. I think there's lots of ways in which there's nuance here. It could go the other way. It could go when everybody has fewer friends. Each friendship link just means more. Because if I think about it, there's just a fixed amount of time I can spend across all my friends. And if I have 300 friends, the Syrian I'm adding, I don't really have much time for them. If I only have 50 friends, the Syrians I'm adding, it gets a lot of attention, guidance, information flow. So it could go either way. I agree with you. We so initially have an issue about what this is an indicator. Why do we more? care about this per se? So, I'm, yeah. so, I'm, so a lot of, in some sense, what I'm doing here is I'm taking this number of local German friends as an object of interest per se. In the paper, we spend a lot of time showing that it correlates things with things like labor market integration and like maybe other outcomes that we might care more about. We somehow took the, which actually turned out to be a controversial stand because it turns out that there's some people that think, you know, integration, like asking for more integration per se, is already imposing on people to change their, this is not assimilation. This is just like, I'm going to make the apparently somewhat controversial statement that like, if you in, immigrate to a place, it's better if you have more local friends, right? And that's what I'm going to define, and that's what I'm going to decompose. I agree with you that there's nuances around, you know, does that extra friend, is that more important or less important across different places, and so on. I'm just at a first order, just going to ignore it. So this is the movers design, that same graph for general friendliness. It's very precisely estimated because people make lots more friends on average with Germans, and relative friendliness. So for general friendliness, the slope's about 0.7. That's interesting to me. That's much bigger than I thought, because it says you take someone from northern Germany, you move them to southern Germany. Within a year, they adjust their rate of making new friends by 70 percent or by 70 percent of you know, the difference between where they come from and where they go to. Um, actually, younger movers have an even bigger slope. So you can decompose this. If you move at age 50, you're probably grumpy and you move somewhere new and you're just setting your ways. You're not going to change. If you move at age 25, the slope's nearly close to one. Across the set of people that do move in equilibrium, it's about 0.7, right? So that's the general friendliness, which again, why I'm so careful to be like, this is local equilibria in some sense. So it's not like the people in Hamburg are just generally grumpy. It's like there's something about being there where like people don't interact as much with each other, but that same person actually interacts more when they move to a place where that's more than the social norm. Now, here is on relative friending, and here we get a slope that's essentially one. Right? which basically means my rate of befriending Syrians within a year of moving moves all the way from that of the origin to the destination. In some sense, to me, this was the most like, uplifting graph in the you know, Talk about these low levels of integrations on average, again, you know, with my interpretation of the absolutes. This suggests that it's not like people are inherently racist in some parts. 
It suggests that it is some, you take the same person and you move them to a different place and they adjust their behavior substantially. Which then kind of gets us to the question of what's different about these places and like how can we change that? Um, there's one caveat here, which is we can only identify this among movers, right? So someone who's willing to move across places adjust their behavior one for one. But there's probably people who move are probably somewhat different from people that don't move. And I don't know the counterfactual of if I moved someone who's just unwilling to move by themselves somewhere else, would they adjust as much? I just can't, I just don't know. I would probably guess it's a little less than one for one, but how much? It's pure speculation. So that suggests that something about place seems to be contributing to integration, in particular towards relative friending. And so that then leads the last 15 minutes to the question that being like, you know, a lot in our minds, what is it? Is it civic programs? Is it geography, government policy, local equilibrium? What is it about that? Something starting out with something descriptive, I'm just going to show you correlations. What are these places where what are higher? And then I'm going to pick one of them, which is the government program. I'm going to make a causal claim about that one. But next graph is all going to be correlations, right? Just add, so what about language? Just simple them speaking German, you can't tell. At least you should have a subset of the movers among the Syrians that move and, and you know that they speak German. You could do, could you do the same? I've done, we, in the paper does everything I'm showing you today with friends, one for one with our other integration outcomes, the joining the German groups and posting content in. No, German. the exact same exercise, but conditional on speaking German. I've not done that yet. I should do that. Um, okay. And in good. fact, I would like to see that also for Turks. So if you could sort of get some other. Yeah. Uh, but the problem, already yeah. Knows German. Turks is a little tricky just because would really allow us to identify the Syrians as having basically seen most of them in Syria in the data before. The Turks are the third generation, and I can't use, you know, use names. Uh, personally identifiable information can't use that. <laughs> One could, I can't. Um, okay, so here in terms of correlation, so what do we find? Um, these two are, this one here is not surprising, places that are on average older, less integration. That's just, again, this homophily. Young people come in, they're more likely to make friends with young people when the population encounter is more likely to be old, less friendly. Population density. City is bad for integration, right? That's an interesting one. When we decompose that, that's all driven by general friendliness. Everybody struggles making friends in city. Sociologists have written books about the loneliness of cities. You move there, lots of people around, you don't really know anyone. Relative friending is actually better in city, right? But the overall lower integration is all because anyone moving into cities just really struggles to connect socially. Um, labor market outcomes, right? More people unemployed, less integration. That was kind of the discussion we had earlier on. Um, it does correlate with, you know, vote share for the right wing parties, you know, and, and the flip side of that, how much, you know, people join the pro immigration groups on Facebook. Um, this is an interesting one. Places where there were lots of Syrians in 2010, so coming back to this question, places with lots of integration experiences of Syrians, that doesn't really predict. Go to the integration experiences of Turkish people and so on. A lot of them are in that like part of North Rhine Westphalia where integration outcome was bad, actually goes the other way. So it's not like you have experience integrating people, it helps you do. When lots of Syrians arrive at the same time, which is really bad for integration, that kind of does a discussion we had here. In some sense, it's just a, some sense a substitute. There's lots of others around and so on. I'm going to focus on this one here. How many integration courses per Syrians are completed? So what are integration courses? Integration courses are a key policy tool in Germany. It was like the key integration policy tool the German government had. Teach language skills, culture, civics, etc. Now, in the beauty of German bureaucracy, it was once decided that in order to offer a course like this, you had to have a formal qualification or experience teaching German as a second language. There are not many people with that experience around. You have a million Syrians that arrive. You need to offer a ton of these courses. It took like two years before that got relaxed, right? There were German teachers who have experienced teaching German to German who are not allowed to offer these courses. Complete craziness. But what it gives us is it gives us nice identification because there is spatial variation in the unemployment rate across this very small subset of people that are qualified to teach these courses that um, we're going to use to instrument for the availability of courses using this. I'm showing you that in the next few slides. This is just purely correlational. Places where more courses were completed are places with higher integration outcomes, but that could just be that the Syrians here want to integrate more so they take the courses, right? So we're going to instrument for, for this with the teachers. So how are we going to do that? So this is the first stage to some extent. And what we're doing is we're going to regress how many courses per Syrian were completed. 
We're going to control for a whole range of outcome vari control variables. I need so much we can do because we don't have that many counties. But importantly, we're going to control for the general unemployment rate. And then we're going to use the unemployment rate amongst a very specialized subset of teachers to instrument for how many courses were completed. There's actually four types of teachers whose unemployment rates you can observe in the data. General school teachers, they were not allowed to teach this course. The unemployment rate is no predictive power. Vocational school teachers were not allowed to teach this course, zero. Driving and sports teachers, I mean, this is just because the administrative data has it in there. It's not nothing. These, this very, very small group of people who have that very special qualification, unemployment rate amongst them predicts course completion, right? Um, so a pretty strong F-stat, given, you know, this is a county level regression. You can actually also use the corresponding unemployment rate amongst these teachers two or three years earlier. And it's not that powerful because there's so few of these people around, the unemployment rate is fairly non unpersistent Like five of them move away. I mean, we're really talking about that sort of small sample variation here in some of these counties, right? So here's the, here's the second stage of the IV estimation. So this is now IV. So more integration courses per serian as instrumented for by the availability of teachers to teach these courses um, leads to higher integration outcomes, right? But crucially, it doesn't shift general friendliness, which it shouldn't, right? Just because you know, this is the part where like Germans prefer Syrians because they're just generally more jovial. That doesn't move around at all. It all comes because of, you know, Germans befriending Syrians closer to their population share in those places where the Syrians have completed more of these integration courses, right? You don't have data on like how many spots were actually available in these courses? We do not have that. All we have data for in the administrative data is the completion. And then the, and then, so I, I wish we did. I suspect that would be like a zero stage, right? You'd want that if you have more teachers, you have more spots available. I just don't have that opinion. Anecdotally, I mean, this was, like, if you go back to the newspapers at the time, people thought this was crazy, right? I mean, the fact that, like, you have all of these teachers here around, you know, who teach German to high school students, but are not allowed to offer these courses, right? And so, um, so the fact that there was enormous constraints on the availability of the courses, and that this was driven <laughs> by this crazy policy rule, which might have made sense in a world where there were no immigrants, but not when you have a million people come in and lots of people wanting to teach and help. And you somehow don't get your act together because of some procedural stuff. Um, you know, that, and something we, we mean, that, that's like, it's, it's, I mean, it's like common knowledge, but there was a lot of frustration in the media around the time about like, can we just get our act together and just allow more people to teach these courses after? Sandy, yes, that unemployment, just like the unemployment as, a, as an instrument, you could have used employment to population ratio, and employment is like a relative, whatever the definition of uh, teachers is qualified. Oh, you mean rather than yeah. unemployment rate? Yeah, because it's a... How many teachers there in general? Yeah. I, the problem is, again, unless you're registered unemployed, you don't show up in my... I mean, again, I have to work with whatever administrative data I have. Unemployment rate by county, by profession is relative. Just population share of people with that qualification, I just don't know where I would get that. In principle, I think you're exactly right. It, uh, the idea would be very similar. Um, here, it's more like they're available to immediately start working on this, right? They're unemployed, they're looking for a job, they have the qualification. Now the government pays $2 billion for you to offer these courses. So you're like, great, you know, I'm no longer unemployed. But I agree with you, population share of people with the right qualification would have done the same thing. Let me just walk through and then I, I, I go back to question because I get the five minute sign from Steve. And, um, you know, I want to just, here's the two other outcomes, language, like how much they speak German. And this is again, labor market outcomes. So again, instrumenting for how many of these integration courses are completed, you can actually shift labor market participation, you know, through these, through these courses. And again, to me, the fact that this general friendliness is completely unaffected is exactly what I would expect. And again, it's kind of comforting to see that, right? The policy works on the specific margin of Germans' perceptions towards Syrians. Um, okay, so I'm so I'm not going to show you the stuff with the high school for the five minutes. I've previewed that, and it's a very different mindset because we're now thinking about space and local equilibria and so on, but we're going to be starting to think about individual level variation. So I'm going to start doing questions now because we're basically in something I've, you know, I've shown you the results. We've seen that migrants in different regions differ in terms of the integration. 
migrant characteristics don't explain it. These characteristics of, of you know, of, 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 of the residents really matter. And I'm just going to jump sort of to the conclusion and then take more questions starting with Rift. Just in terms of interpretation, Sorry. this is yeah. that you're, you're basically saying that if you make Syrians speak German, Germans will befriend them. So that's one way to think about this. Um, I've talked to a lot of teachers of these courses um, when I was on sabbatical in Germany last year to try and figure out like what they think it is about these courses that can shift these local equilibria. So the courses contain elements of language training, but they also contain elements of broader civics, you know, social system in Germany, legal system in Germany, etc. And it's completely anecdotal, but the, the teachers of these courses I've talked to seem to think the main thing is the civics, the how to behave. A lot of it with respect to like gender relation. So it's like, I mean, you know, it's on silly one said, like basically, you know, when you go to a public swimming pool and the women wear bikinis, you can't just stare at them. Like things like that, which change the equilibrium of how a group of migrants is perceived by a group of Germans. Because the interesting thing here is. Think about the movers move between places. It's not, I take the language course in place A, where there's lots of them around, then I move to place B, and, my, and like, I'm now going to be able to do well. It's about equilibrium perceptions of groups. right? So the fact, if I move, even if I've taken a course, if I move to a place where there's an equilibrium where the groups interact well and have positive views of each other, and then move to a place where that's not the case, even though I personally have done nothing, nobody knows me, right? So people only interact with you. Like the first thing they have to come across is, this is a Syrian, am I even gonna start an interaction? I think those are the equilibria that change. And I think for that, it's much less do I speak the language, it's some of the, before you even start interacting with someone, things that you can basically tell people as a group to just be like, how, something bad, how to not, how to behave in, in this new environment that they're very unfamiliar with that kind of then opens the door for that first interaction to then start to get to know individuals as individuals that you could then befriend rather than for groups to just to get kind of not interact. It's, that, that, there's nothing in the data that I, that, I mean, what speaks to it is that it is these local equilibria. And you know, if these language courses was all there was, then the movers design would suggest you take that with you, what you learned, the language and so on, is that. So it has to, it's weird that like courses that I teach specific people don't actually affect the integration outcome of that specific person independently of the entire group of people. Um, and so I, my sense is there's a lot of pooling. There's a lot of pooling of individuals with the average behavior of groups, both amongst the Germans and amongst the Syrians. And then when you move somewhere else, you can basically pool with the new equilibrium. And I, I, maybe I, anyway, that's how I've kind of arrived at like what's going on here. Sima. I guess it would be helpful to have some sense of how much is that like local equilibrium and the behavior of the Syrians versus, you know, the percent in support of the right wing party. I'm guessing that is not a reaction to local Syrians and that sort of political views predated Syrian immigration and stuff like that. So some of it does seem to be about the natives. It's, it's hard. It's hard to say. So I, it, it's speculate. I, I don't know. There are certainly a range of events that happened, you know, there was like a, you know, Cologne on like New Year's Eve, there was like, you know, a, a large scale wave of, I think it was sexual assault of women by Syrian refugees that I think led to a dramatic shift in public opinion. Um, this was a countrywide thing. I mean, this was like front page news for six months, right? So, you know, so I, it's, it's a very hard question to what extent political beliefs are endogenous as well, or whether or not they reflect. Yeah, but there some, was some data on like, you know, support for immigration yeah. in 2000, 2010 yes. that would yeah. presumably be- I, I, think, I think it helps, but the point is, at least for the movers, when they move, their behavior switches one for one back to the States, yeah, right? Yeah, so if it was like, I'm, I'm in a yeah. place where like, we will all support the right-wing party and then I move, the fact that I essentially immediately adjust Within a year of moving, I'm basically back to behaving like the people in that other place where they don't vote for the right-wing party. I mean, it'd be interesting to do a voting, a same mover design, right? Does the same person change their vote as they move across place? I think that would be, very, I, I can't do that obviously, but like that would be very informative for your kind of question about how much of it, you know, is an endogenous response, how much of it is fixed beliefs. This is like, 
Everything I've seen here has pushed me away from my initial prior that a lot of that is just a fixed dislike, say, of certain groups. That's like hard to respond to. It seems much more of a equilibrium outcome that changes quite a bit as people live in different environments. Um, and you know, that's kind of consistent with this very last thing that I didn't have time to talk about, right? Contact between Syrians and native Germans, particularly positive contact, say in high school, really influences how these Germans subsequently engage with Syrians, you know, and, and, and whether they befriend Syrians in other settings and so on. So I do think, and you know, it, 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 it relates, I mean, talking about the lunch about Brexit, right? The fact that like the places that voted most for Brexit were the places where there were no immigrants at all, right? And, you know, Brexit was all about immigrants and like those places where there are actually lots of them didn't nearly as much support Brexit as the places where there weren't any. So I think, so I do think this is more endogenous and more of an equilibrium outcome than at least I came into this project believing. I think we all kind of now do the same people, no? I, I think we don't really know from the analysis that it's not the case that the people that take the courses stay and that the movers are very different. I don't know. So that. I think you, I mean, to make the connection that you're making about local equilibrium, we need to kind of say. No, but I think what I'm saying is like, if a person goes from place A to place B, the fact that their ability to make German friends shifts so much, like whether or not they didn't have the course in both places or they did have a course in both places, that would be in the individual fixed effect. The fact that their behavior changes so much tells me it can't have been that they either did or didn't take the course, right? Because that's something that would have been fixed across the two locations, that they themselves took the course. So it's actually more important in some sense to move to a place where lots of other people have taken the course and, and you've got a positive equilibrium than you yourself having taken the course. That, that we don't know whether anyone but the course moved, or whether you, you, the variation that we see from the movers are the ones that took the course. I don't know. Yeah. So, actually, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So, there's another policy margin here, which is um, the incentive for the Syrians to essentially reintegrate. Yes. So, you make it sound like it's always the German who makes the decision to defend, but it's also from the other side. Yeah. And so, that's some clear time. Yeah. Especially no, I mean, for example, this correlation here. Right. right when there are lots of Syrians arriving at the same time, the equilibrium is one of much less integration. That one interpretation of this is that the Syrians just don't make an effort when they have many like there's just no need to make an effort. It could also be that when Syrians don't appear in public spaces as an individual but as a large group, that makes it harder for it's like hard to know. But there is certainly an interpretation here that has nothing to do about the behavior of Germans and it's all. The behavior you know, again friendships the beauty of this friendships is a bilateral thing part of the reason to focus on the natives here is because that's really what's unique about this data like i can actually see who's on the other side of integration i can look at their moves and, and, and study that but yeah but and well, so thanks very much Johannes. that's right